So it's finally here! One of my personal favorite manga pilots has blossomed into a great juggernaut. Dr. Stone has moved past its missteps from its very first early arcs to grow into one of my favorite currently running manga series, and after two years of publication, it's getting an anime adaptation that will hopefully live up to the incredible artwork by series artist Boichi. I have an especially great sense of pride seeing this one step into the world stage, because I always knew this one was going to be a winner. With my dreams of ever becoming a big wig, writer, producer, showrunner practically dead and buried, I can at least pretend to be a development executive by playing Mr. Trendspot and scouting out new things that I believe have the potential to hit it big, then feel an undeserved sense of self-satisfaction when I'm proven right, and it seems like Dr. Stone is on the cusp of finally achieving that. I feel like a proud papa and have an unwarranted sense of superiority over all the new fans who eventually trickle in discovering the series. But there's something else that Dr. Stone does very well, and I think makes it especially noteworthy, and that's how the series manages to tackle its science infotainment better than many of the other pro-science and STEM series, that are getting lauded as the big movers and shakers in terms of bringing science to the masses and encouraging more people to pursue careers in science. So stick around as we get to ready to break into how Dr. Stone does science infotainment right. You gotta love to be gone back yet. Love to be gone back yet. grab it. So for all of you not familiar, Dr. Stone is the story of how a mysterious light envelops the entire world and turns every living human on the planet into stone. Then 3,700 years pass into the future and after being encased in stone, high school teenager Taiju breaks out of a stony prison to find a completely transformed world where nature has reclaimed the earth from human civilization. Now the series quickly switches focus after the first early story arcs, getting rid of Taiju completely because he's terrible and boring and moving the focus squarely onto Senku, the beloved mad science genius who loves science so goddamn much, he has E equals MC squared scrawled in his own blood on his leather cloak. Now what makes this premise so great is that in all honesty, I don't really care about the origin of the petrification or whatever bullshit magic could be behind it. But rather what's interesting is the question of how to rebuild mankind's scientific heritage from scratch without any of the tools of modern civilization. The series is at its best when Senku is building stuff and solving problems, and the dual combination of famed Korean artist Boichi's incredibly detailed art that's pliable enough to create the incredible dramatic poses as well as some of the best facial fracture gags I've ever seen in the medium, along with Richiro Igonaki's storytelling creates an unholy fusion where making ramen or finding all the ingredients to create antibiotics is just as compelling if not more so than the universe shattering battles of something like Dragon Ball. What I love is that this makes each new technological advancement serve as a kind of power-up that feels fresh and exciting, and also makes me interested in a world of science that most other media designed for that topic usually utterly fails to. Now, in our current cultural climate, nothing has been emphasized more than the importance of STEM education. And I don't deny anyone here watching the video who's still in high school or just starting on college, the best advice I could give you is to pursue computer science or some other science field because it pays much better than most of the other humanity degrees that most universities try to peddle. This is often used as a diversity issue to try and get more POCs or people of color and women into the field of science, and to that credit, if anyone watching this fits that bill and likes money, then by all means you should go for it. There's a world of difference between eating at a tech company's fully stocked free kitchen versus eating a honey bun out of a depressing vending machine in the break room. I've seen and experienced both. And I think one thing that a lot of the pro STEM media seems to overlook is that not everyone is really built for careers in the hard sciences. Shows like Star Trek or the recent reboot of Bill Nye the Science Guy are supposed to be tools that help drive young people's interest towards loving the world of science, but here's the cold hard truth. Oh hey, it's my special friend, Academy Award nominated documentary filmmaker Werner Herzog. Looks like he came by to pay a visit. How's it going, Mr. Herzog? Ah uh, yes, I heard you wanted to have me in to discuss the nature of science. Science is the tool of reason in a cold, indifferent, and largely uncaring universe. It is a way for us simple primates to try and make sense of a largely senseless universe that is indifferent to our ineffective and ultimately meaningless desire to divine purpose and reason from our lives. We think of ourselves as superior to other organisms because we can make metal tubes that move us underground or fly us into space. But the irony is... The more we create and uncover the mysteries of the universe, the more we kill ourselves, and our planet and all of that progress is built upon the corpses of organisms we view as inferior. We monkeys use other monkeys who we deem as lesser, inferior beings, then use them as test subjects to find remedies for the problems we have created for ourselves through our science, and this is what we call progress. But that is what science is. 
It is the cold, uncaring steel caress of progress built upon the hundreds and thousands and millions of dead monkey corpses strewn about in laboratories all across the globe to test cosmetics and cure the cancers we inflict upon ourselves through our industrialized materialistic greed and our unending desire to consume processed foods. We care as little for the monkeys as the universe cares for us, but that is the nature of science. It is as indifferent and immoral as a wire mesh mother offering food to a baby monkey. But the baby monkey would rather starve, clinging to its cloth mother, so it can have the illusion of love. But there is no love in science, and any true scientist will know that they must kill the love in their heart if they truly wish to find truth and meaning in the cold, meaningless void of the universe we inhabit. The truth cares little for how many baby monkeys must be separated from their mothers, tormented or killed to reach it. The truth only cares about results. Um, okay, thanks, Mr. Herzog. That was very cheery and informative. The point is, is that the real science isn't fun or cool. It's long, slow, and tedious. Not everyone is wired or built to construct data tables, but there's this illusion that if you put enough pro-STEM science and cool sci-fi fantasy programming, then suddenly all those people who are only tepidly interested in science at first will put down their smartphones and start running towards labs and programming classes so they can soak up as much science and math as possible. But this never seems to happen, at least not on the scale people would like to believe. Sure, some people were inspired by Star Trek to become engineers in real life, but for most people, a dilithium crystal is just a dilithium crystal. It's pointless fantasy techno babble that holds as much real world value as Harry Potter's spell names. But despite this, there's this painful emphasis in trying to push a kind of stem light narrative seen in such things like the Bill Nye revival on Netflix made for people like. Cause my sex joke is so oh oh oh, much more than either oh oh oh. Honestly, I have no idea who the show was supposed to be for. And of course, the recent Star Trek Discovery, but all these efforts kind of feel a bit disingenuous and more like something like this. I like science. Science! Fuck yeah! You guys, this is so fucking cool. It is fucking cool. Math! Fuck yeah! Now this is the power of math. This is the power of math, people! Come on! You are correct, Ensign. I like science. See what I mean? If you're naturally gifted and inclined to pursue math and science, go for it. You'll make a lot more money than anyone pursuing the humanities or the arts, but at the same time, please don't try and sell me a bunch of whiz-bang techno-babble fantasy schlock is going to be the key to bringing to life our next generation of scientists, because you're not going to be stepping into a lab than walking out with a phaser or tricorder or a freaking lightsaber. So let's stop kidding ourselves that this does anything to help promote that. And that's what Dr. Stone does differently. Unlike something like Star Trek where the science is merely window dressing, the science is the narrative of Dr. Stone. Everyone has the apocalyptic fantasy of having all the conveniences of modern life wiped away and starting from scratch, but the question isn't how the world ends, but how is it reborn? How do you reclaim centuries of technological innovation when you have nothing? Hell, I'd go as far as arguing that the reason why the Walking Dead comic has endured for so long is largely because Robert Kirkman sought to answer that question. Not show the zombie apocalypse, but depict what does the world that's built up after the zombie apocalypse look like. And that's when the series is at its most interesting, not when there's some new evil despot calling themselves the governor, or an even bigger zombie horde bearing down on Rick and company, but rather when survivors are rebuilding and making a new civilization. Rebuilding from the ashes and trying their best to reclaim their lost technological heritage to create a new modern world. That's when The Walking Dead is at its most compelling. Not when it's a soap opera with the occasional zombie attack. And that's probably why the comic just recently ended. Because in its heart of hearts, Robert Kirkman knew he only had two stories to tell in The Walking Dead universe. And all he could do was repeat them instead of making drama and intrigue of what it takes to build from scratch. And that is what makes Dr. Stone so compelling. In trading away the typical supernatural or sci-fi based superpowers that typically dominate the shonen genre, merely building a pulley system or creating electricity become epic moments of incredible drama. Perhaps one of my favorite moments from one of the early arcs is where Senku sparks a light bulb to life for the first time in 3,700 years, 
bringing light to a primeval darkness that had dominated the Earth since the fall of man. Each new crafting adventure and discovery builds new enthusiasm, where bringing simple things back like carbonated soda or bread feel like epic achievements on par with Goku beating the next bald alien of the week into submission. And as Senku introduces more and more modern innovations into the stone world, he begins changing people's minds towards embracing the wonders of modern civilization that we largely take for granted. And that's why I love this series so much. It manages to weave its high school science lectures along with its storytelling much more smoothly than most other series. And honestly, this series is always at its best when Senku and his crew are crafting some new gizmo or gadget or using the limitations of whatever natural resources they have at hand. And for something to be so engaging for what basically amounts to going into the woods or building stuff in your garage, I think it's an incredible achievement when you can make things like this as engaging as the typical energy-laced supernatural battle that typically defines Shonen Jump. Dr. Stone's worst moments are the very few scenes where it dips away from arcs focused around building or crafting and go towards a more traditional battle manga mode, but thankfully they're relatively few and far between. I'm hoping that overall the anime series does the manga series justice. If not, I'd highly recommend you check it out on your own time, and if the anime is good, then you can follow it along with me week to week, and I think this is one of the few examples of IFL science edutainment done right. And a special thank you to Asterios Kokonos for providing the voice of Werner Herzog. Check out all of his crazy podcasting adventures at patreon.com slash Asterios. His madcap adventures have kept me entertained for hours at a time. Such crazy adventures like being sued by an old aging internet icon for $20 million, boxing a moderator from the Trump Reddit, and meeting the insane founder of Garfield Eats. Asterios gets into the best shenanigans. Become a Patreon and enjoy his podcast adventures. I promise they will keep you engaged because something terrible will probably happen to him. So remember, that's patreon.com slash Asterios. Thanks for sticking around, and remember, lobsters and tennis, but don't you grab it. <laughs>